Good morning. It is so good to have you all here this morning, those who are worshiping with us in person and those who are worshiping with us on Facebook Live. I'm certainly glad to be with you as we gather to praise and glorify our God. Uh, just a few reminders of what's going on here in the church. Uh, the biggest thing is our church picnic that's coming up on August 15th. That's only three Sundays from today. There is a sign-up sheet out in the narthex. You can't miss it. It's, it's life-size, you know, big. And you're encouraged to sign up to commit to coming, how many are coming with you, and what uh, side dish, dessert, or salad that you are bringing with you um, to share. Uh, right, I, before the early service, we had 25 signed up, and now we have over 30 signed up. So uh, if you have not signed up, please take a moment before you leave today and sign up for the picnic. Those of you who have asked us for a hard copy of the newsletter, we invite you to pick up your copy out in the narthex before you leave if you have not already done so. The rest of you, you should have received it online uh, in your email box. Um, so um, please take a look at it and see what's in it. Um, and to our seventh through 12th graders, I invite you to consider participating in the youth ministry program at Wesley United Methodist. We have um, formed a partnership with them and to collaborate on junior, senior high youth ministry. They meet Sunday evenings at six o'clock in the Wesley Community Center. So you will be invited and welcome there if you decide to go. We have our bell choir here this morning who is going to help our hearts and our minds get in, into the frame of mind for worship. And we appreciate you being here. So let us prepare our hearts for worship.
Thank you, choir and Renee. What shall we do when we are worried? What shall we do when our lives seem too crowded and busy? Let us take time for the refreshing words of God's love for us. God, 
You have placed within the hearts of all your children a longing for your word and hunger for your truth. Grant that we may know your Son to be the true bread of heaven and share this bread with all the world. Amen. A reading from the letter to the Ephesians, chapter 4. I, therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might fill all things. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness in deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the body, whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. The Gospel of the Lord. It's actually the word of the Lord that was not a gospel. I just went into pastor mode for a second. As we venture into chapter 4 of the letter to the Ephesians, the word motto comes to mind. Made me ask, what is our Christian motto? Before we answer that, let's look at one of the most famous mottos there is. E pluribus unum. You may have heard that or read that somewhere. This is the Latin phrase that means out of many, one. It originally referred to the diverse American colonies desire to unite into one nation. Throughout American history, people have also seen it as the motto for the incorporation of diverse people into American society. Could this motto also apply to our Christian faith? When we read chapter 4 of Ephesians, we are reminded that a wide variety of people with diverse gifts and interests make up Christ's worldwide church. Yet diversity makes unity an elusive quality. We live in a fractionalized society 
that forms special interest groups to advance one's own specific causes. Both those who proclaim and those who hear Ephesians 4 also tend to spend their time with people who share the same interests and perspectives. Little even seems to unite most Christians. We have not only diverse interests and perspectives, but also varied talents and gifts. Yet in Ephesians 4, we are reminded that God expects dissimilar Christians to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. God's adopted sons and daughters do this by, among other ways, acting, thinking, and talking much like Jesus had. After all, we enhance Christian unity by being completely humble and gentle and as well as patient, bearing with one another in love. Yet how do these exhortations differ from, for instance, a pep talk that a principal might give on the first day of school? Verse 1's word, therefore, signals to us the basic difference. It connects those moral qualities presented in the passage before it. God is working to bring all things together under Christ. Jesus came, according to Ephesians 2.16, to reconcile both Jews and Gentiles to, the God, to God through the cross. In other words, while Christians are naturally alienated, not just from God, but also from each other, God, by the Holy Spirit, is working hard to make us one. However, we are expected to make a deliberate effort to contribute to that unity. Enhancing Christian unity requires us to embrace counter-cultural, Christ-like attitudes and actions. In a world that increasingly seems to embrace arrogance, violence, and short-temperedness, Christians are called to embrace humility, gentleness, and patience. Yet these words may sound almost graceless to those whom God saves by God's grace that we receive with our faith. This challenge in verse 1, to lead a life worthy of our calling, may sound like a call to somehow earn God's great grace. That's why we need to remember the transforming power of God's grace. God does not just graciously accept and save sinners. God also regenerates us. That is, God's Spirit makes us more and more like Jesus. So when the author of Ephesians challenges God's adopted sons and daughters, us, to live in a way that's worthy of God's saving call, they are simply describing the most appropriate response to God's amazing grace. As God's beloved children, we are to respond to God's grace by no longer following a path of faithless disobedience. Instead, we are to walk in a way that honors God in humility, gentleness, and loving patience. 
Christians walk in a way that works for peace among all people. You and I need to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. We can't really overstate how important keeping this unity was to the author of Ephesians. The author expects God's people to do everything in their power to enhance the church's unity as well as make it more visible. That's why the unity of the Spirit is based primarily in the triune God's unity. There can be only one body because there is only one Spirit. There can be only one church because there is only one Spirit. One Lord and one Father are three persons with the Spirit who together are one God. Christian unity is not found in the fact that all Christians believe the exact same thing or worship in the exact same way. Our unity is found in the triune God whom we worship through Jesus Christ. God's people can be diverse in our beliefs and practices, yet make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit because the God whom we worship is one. So those who worship this triune God can recognize our differences, even as we long for the day when they will disappear in the dazzling light of God's glorious presence. We can also work to express our unity by working in missions and ministries with Christians from diverse faith traditions as well as with those of our own. In fact, Christians can also look for ways to work with Christians whose gifts differ from their own. After all, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God, who works all of them in all people. As Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 12, so there is much diversity within Christianity, and it's okay. Christians come from different backgrounds, with different personalities and interests. God also gives us a very wide variety of gifts and talents to work as preachers and teachers, musicians and artists. Yet it is one God who by God's Spirit gives us all those diverse abilities. So those very gifts that sometimes seem to divide us actually unite us because they are all gifts of the one Spirit. Through, the, through God's Spirit, some have been gifted to be apostles, or at least to do apostolic things. Other people have been gifted to be prophets, to speak for God to God's people. Still others have been gifted to be evangelists, to relate to unbelievers and address God's word to their circumstances. And others to be preachers and teachers, to care for God's people by teaching them the word, as well as encouraging them in their love for God and for each other. God doesn't want God's people, us, to be ignorant about the, those incredibly diverse spiritual gifts that have been graciously given to us. God has given us these gifts for the very specific purposes to prepare Christ's church for service. We are also challenged to use our spiritual gifts 
to help God's people become spiritually mature. God gives us diverse spiritual gifts to build God's church toward deeper and deeper unity in our knowledge of God in Christ, among other things. By knowing and using these gifts, we more clearly can demonstrate that unity. However, as God's however, as God's, we use the spiritual gifts God gives us. The Spirit will also build a stronger sense of that unity. One of the quickest ways to feel like we are a part of any community is to participate in its ministries, to participate in it fulfilling its purposes, its goals. And as we both learn and use our gifts, as we participate with others in our various, mini in, in various ministries, we increase increasingly recognize the true place God has given to not only us, but also to our brothers and sisters in the faith. There are some things that hinder our ability to use the gifts God has given us, such as being busy or feeling worn out and tired from using our gifts for so many years. That's why we are all encouraged to both know and to use our spiritual gifts. This way, even God's busiest and most tired people can continue to serve God in some way with their talents. This week, I ask us to specifically pray about how we are or are not using the spiritual gifts with which we have been blessed and to make a specific effort to learn what gifts we have if we are not already aware and how to better use the gifts that we have for bringing about Christian unity in our community here as church and as our community outside our four walls. Many hands make light work for all. We've heard that phrase here at Messiah many, many times. We're well familiar with it. When we think about it, it's really just another way of saying e pluribus unum, out of many, one. And the people of God said,
the Lord be with you always. Let us offer to one another a sign of Christ's peace. The Lord's peace be with you all.
You are forgiven and loved into abundant life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lift up your hearts and give thanks to the Lord our God. In the night in which Jesus was betrayed, our Lord took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us pray with confidence to the Father in the words our Savior gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Christ has set the table with more than enough for all. Come.
us pray. Jesus, bread of life, we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Rooted in Christ and sustained by the Spirit, we offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all of creation. Bless the ministries of our neighboring congregations, empower churches throughout the world, and encourage missionaries who accompany global neighbors. Kindle on us a spirit of collaboration that all people may know your loving works. Hear us, O oh God, your, your mercy, mercy is great. great. Cast out arrogance, selfishness, and corruption, and instruct those who lead to practice compassion and humility. Inspire them with a vision of the common good and a commitment to ensure that all who hunger are fed. Hear us, O oh God, your, your mercy, mercy is great. great. Deepen our resolve and you, to use what we have to serve those in need. When we worry that we do not have enough resources for ministry, assure us of your abundance. Hear us, O oh God. Your, your mercy, mercy is with We confess, repent, and reject the times when we as a church and as individuals have been silent in the face of racial injustice. Heal the hearts of those affected by racism in our community and worldwide. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of healing, we pray for those who are suffering or who are sick, especially Bishop Michael Lozano, those on our prayer list, and those we now name in your presence. Surround them with your unwavering presence. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy, your mercy is great. great. We give thanks for the faithful ancestors in every age whose lives have pointed us toward you, especially Charles Window, Elizabeth Davies, Shirley Bennett, Gustav Anderson, and Frank Hughes. May we be reunited with one another in the last days. Hear us, O oh God. Your, Your mercy, mercy is great. Safe. We pray for peace in the world and for the safety of all military personnel, especially those who have congregational ties. Hear us, O oh God. Your, Your mercy, mercy is, great. is great. O God, we lift these and all our prayers to you, confident in the promise of your saving love through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The blessing of God, who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us, be upon us now and forever, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
You are the body of Christ. Thanks be to God. And I do hope you all have a great and blessed week.